Tonight, a new housing report for St. John's doesn't paint a pretty picture. Now, people say it's still a challenge to find housing in the city of St. John's. If we don't have nowhere to go in two weeks, like we have to pack up and leave the province. If the province is listening, rent control. According to a new report released this week, things could get worse. I'm Mike Moore. I'll have that story coming up. I think we just need to be real about the numbers. A reality check on child care spots in this province. Advocates say there are fewer spaces than government admits. My God, do you think I don't know that my son in the throes of his addiction would sell me to get money for drugs? Addiction affects more than the substance abuser. A mother who's been helping others since the mid 90s talks to us about the pain of addiction and how to get help. This is CBC Here and Now. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. A new housing report released this week paints a potentially bleak picture for St. John's. It's the city's first housing needs assessment in three years. And as Here and Now's Mike Moore reports, the city's housing issues could get worse. Joanna Murphy only has two weeks to find a place to stay. She and her husband have been trying desperately. The rent at their last apartment was going up $400 this year and they simply couldn't afford it and had to leave. But now they and their young daughter are staying with a friend, but that can only last so long. If we don't have nowhere to go in two weeks, like we have to pack up and leave the province. Because I mean, there's nothing here. If you know, if there's nothing here, we can't stay here. And it's sad to leave, like my husband's job now been for 11 years, and it's sad to leave his job for 11 years. Murphy says apartments are being scooped up before she has a chance. She says landlords are being flooded by hundreds of messages every day. By 10 o'clock this morning, she had already sent applications for six different apartments. She's feeling the stress of the city's larger housing problem. I have family here, like my mom and dad's here, my brother's here, my sister's here, my niece, and... Uh, It's pretty sad I would have to pack up my own family and move away from my own family. Murphy is just one part of a big problem the city is facing. A housing report released this week outlines how demand is going up, which means affordability is going down. And that gap is likely to grow in the future. Councillor Ophelia Ravencroft is the head of the city's affordable housing working group. The report highlights one problem for renters. Most new construction is aimed at single families, not creating new apartments. And the demand is only expected to increase. The picture that this paints very clearly to me is that we are looking at a market that is growing, you know, although core unaffordability, I believe, to a, was down a small amount, uh, a lot of the figures in here are obviously quite alarming in terms of particularly at the level of unaffordability, unsuitability of housing for renters in the market. Right now, the report says the city is already short 1,000 to 1,300 units. It's expected to get worse as the population grows. The report says five years from now, we're expected to need another 2,700 to 3,700 units. One thing the city would like to see is rent control. That would help people like Murphy from getting priced out of their apartment. That falls outside their jurisdiction and goes to the provincial government. Newfoundland and Labrador is one of the only provinces in the country that doesn't have restrictions on how much rent can go up. Mike Moore, CBC News, St. John's. Well, RCMP officers have arrested a man who managed to elude them for nearly a month. Tony Farrell was arrested on Wednesday at a home in Marystown. Police had been searching for the 36-year-old man since mid-July. That's when his arrest warrant was issued in connection to several charges, including dangerous operation of a vehicle, failing to stop for police and possession of stolen goods. The search ramped up on July 26th when police issued a public safety alert for swift currents saying they believed Farrell was armed and violent. Police were told to st told people to uh, stay inside and lock their doors. Police now say they finally arrested him yesterday in a home where he was hiding. 
The police are investigating two suspected cases of arson on Belle Island. It's the latest in a long line of suspicious fires there going back over a decade. Our CMP say just after midnight on August 11th, an abandoned home on Lance Cove Road was discovered on fire. And then two days later, another abandoned home was on fire on Brother Lane's Road. Both homes were destroyed. In April, two men were charged with arson after another home on Lance Cove Road was destroyed. RCMP say human remains found on the Port of Port Peninsula earlier this month have been identified as Tyler Hennessy, who was first reported missing last September. His car had been located, but after extensive searches, police didn't find him at that time. Well, a Conception Bay South company and a supervisor had been fined after a workplace death nearly three years ago. The employee from Triple J Aggregates died in September 2020 at a quarry where they were working. The company was convicted of two offenses and fined $80,000. It must pay the fine within a year. Supervisor Bill Ware was found guilty over the failure to ensure the safety of a worker. He's been ordered to pay $4,000 within 90 days. Well, beautiful sunshine out there today. I did have a screen there, but it's not there anymore. This was supposed to be the harbor, but yes, lots of sunshine, 17 degrees. Humidex values, uh, not quite warmer than that, about 20 at the moment. There it is, popped up finally. <laughs> See, beautiful shot there. Uh, east southeasterly is about nine kilometers per hour. The story across the island is lots of sunshine. Not the story up across parts of Labrador, though. A cold front extending, which is bringing some rain down to the southeast, so an absolutely beautiful day today. And, uh, it is going to progressively get cloudier as we head through uh, the night tonight, especially across the island. These showers will become more numerous up across Labrador, and we're watching another area of showers move in. These will likely be heavy at times as we head into Saturday night into early Sunday and then continuing through the day on Sunday. In fact, going to bring some uh, pretty significant rainfall to parts of the province, but particularly the Port of Basque area, southwestern corner of Newfoundland, where we could see upwards of 70 millimeters of rain. I'll break all of that down for you and we'll talk about Franklin too when I come back. Thanks, Ashley. Child care advocates are criticizing the provincial government's progress when it comes to creating more child care spaces. The province has promised 6,000 new spaces by 2026, but advocates say they haven't made a dent in that figure. Here are now Heather Gillis reports. And there are currently 8,300 child care spaces operating at $10 a day or lower. That sounds like a lot of spaces, but child care advocate Yolande Potty Sherman says there haven't been many net new ones added. I think we just need to be real about the numbers. Only 258 more kids in 2023 have access to regulated child care spaces than did in 2021. So I think we just need to remember that we are also losing spaces as the same time we're gaining them. So overall, it was a bit of a disappointment. Neria Elward is with the Jimmy Pratt Foundation, which recently released a roadmap about how to make more child care space. She agrees with Potty Sherman and says the pre-kindergarten pilot program government highlighted this week isn't working. A universal kindergarten, junior kindergarten program, we believe, would, would be a lot quicker to deploy the education minister wouldn't say how high demand is for child care, but Potty Sherman says government should already know. I think it's a bit of a stall tactic. Um, they know where the demand is. They know what the demand is. They know how many kids there are. Let's make it universal. Meanwhile, she says the first thing they need to do is recruit and retain workers to create more child care. So we really need to keep uh, keep advocating for dignified working conditions for early childhood educators. And that includes things like mandatory paid sick days. So a 2019 survey showed that less than half of ECEs in this province have uh, access to paid sick days. Less than half had access to paid vacation. Less than a third have, have had access to paid coffee breaks. And Aylward says benefits like pensions keep ECEs in the workforce. And so it's really, really surprising to me how non-committal they have been. It's such a, a clear fix. It's demonstrated that it works. Um, and it's just because it's expensive. That's, I assume, the main drawback. 
Both advocates say any expansion of the child care system needs to be a government-led public system like health care or the school system, while Potty Sherman would like to see things like transportation and inclusion for kids with exceptionalities. Heather Gillis, CBC News, St. John's. Well, today the Atlantic Salmon Federation launched a salmon conservation program that includes several rivers across the Atlantic provinces, and one of those is the Terra Nova River. But unlike other conservation programs that focus on fish at risk, this program targets areas where salmon thrive to ensure that doesn't change. We're looking at watersheds that have active salmon fisheries so that we can have stewards out on the water and there must be at least one group of people in the area that is already engaged in river activities. So on the Terra Nova in Newfoundland, we have the uh, FABEC, it's the Freshwater Alexander Bays Ecosystem uh, Corporation. So they're our on the ground partner for the Terra Nova. Mm -hmm. Well, it's the architecture that draws many people to check out the International Lounge at the Gander Airport. But today, visitors got something else as well. Her parting words were, I see you soon. I see you someday. Musician Evan Smith gave a noontime concert today, highlighting something some people may have overlooked, the public piano. Now, you don't need to be a professional. Anyone is welcome to play it. The concert was meant to bring attention to the piano with the hope it will get more use. Inuk artist Billy Gauthier usually spends months carving a sculpture you could hold in one hand. But for the Bonavista Biennale, Gauthier had just one week to work on his grandest canvas, a 600-pound whale skull. He worked day and night carving what he calls his important piece. Have a look. I always try and listen to the material. I, I didn't come here with a plan. My only plan was to listen and to just work and work and work and hope that it was going to come out right. Hi, my name is Billy Goche. I'm an Inuk sculptor from Labrador. Nunatsiavut is uh, what we would call our, uh, our lands in the northern part of Labrador. Right now we're in uh, Dirtle's Home Hardware uh, Warehouse. The Biennale approached me uh, about working on a piece during this event and I, I knew I wanted to, to work on something on a grand scale. And this is a giant fin whale. A fin whale is the second largest animal on the planet. This is the skull. The very first feature that I seen that really drew my eye was right here. And I recognized that it was a mouth and it was speaking to me. So I carved the eyes so that she could see. And then next I carved the nostrils so that she could breathe and she could smell. Her name, this piece, it's titled The Earth, Our Mother. Earth, right from the beginning, just like from the beginning of the this sculpture, she was speaking. But unfortunately now, we don't listen anymore. So she's not speaking anymore. She's yelling. And the way she yells, she yells through heating the planet, through melting the ice caps, through forest fires. She's yelling loud and we're not even listening. It was just incredible, right, to hear him speak and to hear where this piece, how this piece resonates with him and where it has come from. It was a really special, special. We were lucky to show up at this particular time. Watching the expressions on people's faces when I give them the full description of the piece gives me more hope. So this piece is going to, for the remainder of the Biennale, it's going to stay here where it was created. And this big, beautiful warehouse gave me the shelter that I needed. It, it means a lot to me. This whale skull is, is so much more than a, a medium. It's a, it's a megaphone. We need to start listening to the Earth, to the planet. 
And to be honest, I, I think this is the most important piece I've ever made and potentially that I will ever make because of the meaning. Well, the weekend will feature some sun, sun for some of us and also lots of rain for others. We'll get into the full forecast details. Also talking about the potential impacts of Franklin when I come back. Have a look at this. Some damage after a funnel cloud touched down on land on the northern peninsula. A water spout got too close for comfort in Port tossing the picnic table at the National Historic Site. Yeah, according to the acting site supervisor, it happened around 8 p.m. last night. One staff member saw it throw the picnic table 20 feet into the air, smashing it into pieces. Wow, Terry Burton caught one of the funnel clouds on camera. People in Port say there was more than one funnel cloud in the sky last evening, but uh, this one gave them a bit of a fright. Like there were water funnels on the ocean last evening, um, but just surprised that one came ashore and came onto the land and came so close to our visitor center. And yeah, this is fairly heavy. And to pick one up, 
to throw it 20 feet um, and then to smash it into bits, that's quite a bit of power. Yes, quite a bit indeed. And Ashley, you mentioned uh, that cloud last night. Can you explain like what's going on here? Yeah, so from what I can see, yesterday was essentially the perfect setup for what we call cold core funnel clouds. And that's what happens when you get colder air, which was about five to eight degrees right now over relatively warm ocean. And what happens is that air rises into the colder air above. And if the winds at the upper level are stronger than the atmosphere, uh, or that are stronger uh, at the surface, then that column of air will start rotating and eventually it will tip over and that will create a funnel cloud. And when that happens over water, it's called a water spout. And when that water spout briefly makes it over to land, it's called a tornado. So they're generally weak and would be considered about an EF zero. So maybe topping out at 70, maybe 80 kilometers per hour and they do not last very long. So uh, speaking of funnel clouds, not nothing today, lots of sunshine, nothing but blue sky. In fact, across the island sitting under a ridge of high pressure not the case up across Labrador, though, who still have a cold front uh, that is bringing some shower activity across parts of Labrador and that shower activity uh, is going to intensify as we head through the night tonight and into tomorrow with lots of tropical moisture. In fact, and speaking of tropical moisture, uh, we'll talk a little bit about tropical storm Franklin at the moment. So uh, right now about topping out at about 100 kilometers per hour right now as far as those gusts are concerned. Still expecting the storm to strengthen as we head through the weekend to likely a category two hurricane before it turns east and enters Atlantic Canada. Now at this point I've been showing you these spaghetti plots over the last couple of days. They're good. There is some good news, though. Uh, it does look like these uh, plots or most of the models in this last run are heading further southeast. So that means that if we do see this track again, I've been stressing this, but if things things can certainly change. But at this point, if this is the track or something similar to this, it would keep the strongest winds offshore. And uh, the only thing that we would be really talking about are the potential for some rainfall impact. So we're going to keep an eye, a close eye on that. Uh, but until we get there, speaking of rain, uh, we're in for some rain this weekend, uh, particularly for southwestern portions of the province. Heavy rainfall expected Saturday night into Monday morning. So Environment Canada has issued a special weather statement. Rainfall totals likely between 60 to 70 even more millimeters of rain. And it is tapping into some of this tropical moisture as well. And as we head through fr uh, thir into Saturday, I should say, some of that moisture will start to move in. And that just means what this is here is uh, the water that is in a certain column of air and there's lots of it to uh, fall essentially. And that is what's going to happen as we head into Sunday and eventually Monday that will head further east. Now, as far as tonight is concerned, most of the island will just see clouds on the increase. We're going to continue to see this rain up across Labrador, different situation or different uh, under that front. But as we head into Saturday morning, uh, likely cloudy to start across the island. Things will clear out for most of us as we head into the afternoon, leading to an absolutely beautiful Saturday. Uh, but the rain will move in, become more widespread up across Labrador. And eventually, as we head into the evening hours, the potential for showers on the west coast will change to periods of rain. And this will continue through through Sunday morning and heaviest rain into the afternoon on Sunday and eventually head further east as we head through the afternoon hours. Now, how much rain are we talking? Well, pretty widespread areas of seeing 30 plus millimeters of rain. If I zoom in a little bit on the southwest coast, I mean, showing a little bit higher than that. That likely won't happen, probably closer to 50 to 70 millimeters. Uh, however, in the higher terrain, we may see a bit more than that. Uh, but along the west coast, 30 to 50 millimeters and uh, so that's a pretty good bet, uh, even up across Labrador. Temperatures tonight much warmer than they have been. Uh, coolest through central west coast, otherwise between 10 to 16 degrees across the island. And as we head into tomorrow afternoon, beautiful day for most of eastern Newfoundland, 18 to 22 degrees. You head towards central, a little bit warmer than that, 21, 22, even 23 degrees uh, for parts of the west coast. But again, you'll see that rain move in. Winds will be out of the south around 20 to 40 kilometers per hour. 
And then as far as Labrador is concerned, uh, generally looking at those temperatures between 10 to 17 warmest in Happy Valley Goose Bay. So let's look at your forecast. We'll look ahead when I come back. Thanks, Ashley. Well, zombies are taking over downtown St. John's this weekend, but if you see them, don't panic. They're in town for the first ever St. John's Zombie Festival happening this weekend. Neighborhood Dance Works has been organizing the ghoulish event, which includes makeup training, costume tutorials, and of course, a zombie flash mob set to Michael Jackson's Thriller. My God, do you think I don't know that my son in the throes of his addiction would sell me to get money for drugs? And just ahead, the pain felt by the families of addicts. A mother tells us about her experience and how people can get help.
Well, she's not an addictions counselor, but in recent months, she's received a lot of desperate phone calls from people who say they're struggling with a loved one's addiction. Tina Davies does a lot of work around suicide prevention in the mental health community, but she's also a familiar face in the rehab community. She lost her eldest son to suicide in 1995 and today is doing everything she can to keep her youngest son alive. She sat down with the CBC's Chrissy Holmes earlier this week. It was only recently that I learned that you are helping families with another challenge you know very well um, with your surviving son. When my oldest son Richard took his life, uh, my younger son James was with me when we found him in our home. So that destroyed him. Of course, there's other issues, uh, a couple of other issues, but this was like the cherry on top that just totally destroyed. That was, he was 16 at the time, and today he's 44. So that's how long we've been struggling with this. Um, my goodness, remortgaged our home to get him into rehab, uh, in and out of different rehabs. It's been hell. I'm not going to lie, that's for sure. And as a mother, you are so incredibly torn. That's your child that has this addiction, that uh, all of these things that go through your mind and what they go through. Um, and you want to help them. So you, and so you send money, you give them money because they need to eat, or they need this, or they need that. N knowing deep in your soul that this is part of a manipulation of the disease of addiction, where they want the money for the drugs. Uh, that's just the way it is. And of course, they call that enabling. But you do that as a mom, to because that's your child. At what point did you turn the corner and, and start to see it as enabling? And how did that happen? I'll tell you how it happened. My son was in the Harbor Grace rehab here, uh, and they had a family meeting, and it was being held at the Tuckamore Center. So um, his children, twins, were with us. It was during the summer, and I took them with me because they know, and they also need to be educated, and also know that they're not alone. They're not the only kids who have parents or a parent who has an addiction. Um, and I had never told anybody. And you know, I should, see when I think back about it, I should have known better because I run, <laughs> I run a support group where, and encourage people to talk and to share and all of this. But I go to this family meeting uh, and that's being held and it's a Zoom from, from, the, from the rehab in Harbor Grace and that. And I finally opened up and I said, you know, well, I've been sending, I've been giving my son money because he needed money to live, to, to you know, to eat, to all of this. And I said, and I haven't told my husband. Uh, and I, and I, and there, that's one little tiny issue is here you're doing this and you're not telling your spouse because I don't want to have to deal with that, you know, uh, the, 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 and then the arguing and don't, you know, back and forth and all of that. And the counselor said to me, Tina, that's called harm reduction. You know, you, 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 you see that it's enabling, but in that instance, that's called harm reduction. And I really didn't want to tell my husband because I didn't want him to feel as bad as I felt. And again, and I'm torn because I have, I'm torn between my husband and my son. And that's what happens. You, you're torn and, and that's how families get torn apart. You know, stuff like that. It just goes on and on and on. Between hollering at somebody and screaming and yelling and saying, just stop using, well, that doesn't do a thing. Believe me. <laughs> We've been doing this for 28 years. It just doesn't do a thing. James has attempted suicide twice, had three overdoses that I know of, 
at just recently as much as last weekend. My God, do you think I don't know that my son in the throes of his addiction would sell me to get money for drugs? I know that. I know that. But I still sent him money. And sure, some of it was for food, but some of it wasn't. So, you know, I can't worry myself to death. I tried that. Ended up in the hospital three times, one time for eight weeks. Nothing changed. So, we need to understand something that we have no control over anybody or anything in this life except ourselves. We cannot protect our children from themselves. We, we do have to set some boundaries because we also are entitled to a life. Well, if you or someone you know needs help, there's a mental health and addictions crisis line available. You can reach that by calling 811. Well, as we approach back to school time, some parents in Labrador West are worried about teacher vacancies. This afternoon, I spoke with Jeanette O'Keefe, who's visiting St. John's this week. She's a parent of three students and a member of the Menahek School Council in Labrador West. Teacher shortages has been a challenge in our area, in Labrador West, for quite some time. This year seems to be a little bit worse. Um, we're hearing rumbles that there's about five and a half positions um, in the Manahack High School alone, so vacancies that need to be filled that will have to be done internally. And what are you hearing from other parents or teachers uh, in, in the rest of Lab West and other schools? Is this something that is isolated to Menahek High School or, or are you hearing of other schools that have shortages as well? Definitely other schools. It's an issue, I, I would say, not only in Labrador West, but across the province and beyond that. I'm hearing from a lot of teachers who are concerned, uh, who feel they can't really speak publicly. Um, so I'm just trying to be the voice and shed some light on the issues that we're facing. And what are those teachers saying to you about their concerns? So obviously having to fill five and a half vacancies without the roles being filled means that teachers will be pulled from their current roles into other roles to fill vacancies of the core courses, so math, science, IRT, core French. So it means larger class sizes, um, less prep time for teachers, so that all impacts learning, um, less teachers in the building to just manage the facility itself. And it's a high school, so obviously having less teachers in the building in general is really not great. Of course, you know, when there's a teacher shortage, it affects workloads for teachers, but what kind of effect do you think it has on the students? I, I think it's pretty huge, to be honest. I mean, we're already seeing it over the years um, at Menahek. My daughter's been there a few years, so their larger class sizes, less support, has an impact on the students. Um, teachers who are being put in roles that they really aren't used to and comfortable with creates a little bit of, you know, I mean, the teachers are doing their best, but it's not the specific area that they're, they're trained in and have worked in. So all of that affects the student morale and their, really the quality of their education. And this isn't a new problem, right? No, this is actually um, many years. And so I guess the question we ask ourselves is, why wasn't there more planning and strategy put in place um, to help resolve the issues, to look at retention and recruitment practices, and do there, is there changes needed there? So it's, it's kind of unfortunate and a little bit frustrating, but um, I think for me and for all of the people that I've spoken with, it's how do we bring everybody together? Um, you know. Parents, teachers, board, union, work together and try to find some solutions. And, you know, back to school is right around the corner. You're a parent of three children. How concerned are you? I'm very concerned. Um, it's actually making me, you know, uh, lose sleep, to be honest, because we live in Lab West. We love Lab West. But at the end of the day, um, what does that mean for our future, uh, for our kids' futures? Are they prepared to go on to university or college or wherever they choose to go? So it's, it's definitely concerning. And I'm really speaking on behalf of a lot of other people who've expressed their concerns and just weren't in a position to reach out. And of course, it's not just Labrador City. The Department of Education says just under 20% of teaching jobs still need to be filled. There are nine positions that are vacant in Labrador West and another 20 in the rest of Labrador. The department says recruitment has also been a big challenge on the Northern Peninsula. I kind of wanted to do something that would make a difference. So I started to focus on cooking for people that needed to eat as opposed to people that just wanted to go out for a good time. 
Well, coming up, the head chef at the Gathering Place is sharing his special cod recipe. Well, it's hard to believe, but we're getting down to the final weekends of the recreational cod fishery. And by now, you may be looking for some other ways to prepare fish. The head chef at the gathering place has a popular recipe to share, and he explains why he left the restaurant industry to work with vulnerable communities. Hi, folks. My name is Fred French. I'm the head chef at the gathering place, and today we're going to cook some cod. Today, we're going to do a crusted cod. That's one of our most popular dishes here. Uh, we cook for about 300 people every single day for lunch and about 150 for our breakfast and about 200-ish for supper. So it's always lots of numbers here and we're feeding lots and lots of people. So let's get into it. So first, we have our cod. Cod portions right here. This is what we're gonna be baking. So we're gonna make a nice uh, little savory dressing for to go with our cod. And first, we're gonna go with some breadcrumbs and a little bit of savory, some melted butter, chicken stock, 
and normally would use onions, but we had a great uh, donation of garlic scapes. So we're gonna replace those and put it in our dressing. So basically we're gonna just mix all this up together, put a little pinch of salt and pepper in there, and then we're gonna crust our cod. I cooked for years in fine dining, loved it, but I got kind of tired of the rat race and working long hours. I got a family and I kind of wanted to do something that would make a difference. So I started to focus on cooking for people that needed to eat as opposed to people that just wanted to go out for a good time. And it was just way more fulfilling for myself and just to see the happy faces and everybody that doesn't normally have a hot meal can get a hot meal. And that's just, that's why I do it right now. All right, well now we're gonna pop it in the oven on 375 degrees, around 10 minutes, I guess. Okay, folks, now while the cod is cooking, we're gonna make our tartar sauce to go with this. So, at here, we usually make our own mayo, but today we're just gonna use some bottled mayo, same thing that you might have at home. Just a little bit of mayo. We're gonna use some of our garlic scapes again, right here. A pinch of salt and pepper. Some lemon juice. Pickles. And mustard. And this is gonna be our tartar. We get a lot of donations and I really love going and finding all the different things that we have and trying to make a really wonderful meal out of those things. It's like an episode of Chopped every day I come to work. It's like the fridge is our black box. We get free reign on making delicious meals for our guests. All right, folks, it's time to plate up our meal. We have a little bit of rice here, or spatula. No, rice. Fish. Beautiful charter sauce over it. There you go, one of the Gathering Place's specialties. Mm, nice looking tartar sauce. Well, we have a TikTok rising star in our midst here in the province. Nursing student Jamie Murphy has posted hundreds of videos on the social media app over the past four years. And some of those videos have reached over 100,000 views and he has more than 56,000 followers. Murphy says poking fun at Newfoundland and its people seems to be a winning formula, even though it might get some people riled up. These are the worst places to live in Newfoundland, and they're in no particular order. All right, so first we have Cla <coughs> Sorry. We have Clarenville. <laughs> why? Like, honestly. What? So that moment, that takeoff point, I mean, just what, what was the video and what happened? So I actually started a series called The Worst Places to Live in Newfoundland, okay. and it really drew the audience in because I guess it made people not, it, I guess, angry in like a funny way. Like people were like, oh my God, you did not just say that Clarenville is the worst place to live or something like that, right? Um, which I did, but you know, it started really drawing people in and people were really itching for me to just create more and talk about more places that I think would be the worst to live. And it just became one of those things that everyone was, everyone was tuned into it. All I got to say, Bernice girls, I should have got my tubes tied when I was 18. The stuff the youngsters has yet, hey? Got me going to this old spot up on Kimmel Road here. Now, what did he call it again? Like Starbucks. Your boy, I don't know what that is. I asked him if I can get fish and chips up there, and they all laughed at me. Well, what a beautiful evening in St. John's. Great way to start the weekend. Stay with us. We're celebrating your birthdays and anniversaries next.
Well, it's Friday, so let's find out who's celebrating. Happy 54th anniversary to Edward and Alvina Power of Spanish Room. It's a 50th anniversary for Grenfell and Irene Belbin of Massey Drive. 50th anniversary greetings also going out to Reg and Gloria Penny of Port Blanford. Congratulations to Edith and Kevin Heffernan from Petite Fort who are celebrating their 50th anniversary as well. Happy 60th anniversary to Cecil and Juanita Chater of Labrador City, now in North arm. Wishing Bill and Muriel Marks of Paradise a happy 60th anniversary too. Best wishes going out to Frank and Winifred Bishop of Cupids on their 64th anniversary. Happy 50th anniversary to Peggy and Calvin Johnson from Catalina. Another golden anniversary. Congratulations to Mark and Kathleen Childs of York Harbor. Graham and Ida Keats of Lethbridge are also marking 50 years of marriage. Happy 52nd anniversary to Vince and and Kay Billard of port Congratulations to Roy and Verna Edison of Roddickton on their 57th anniversary. Happy 63rd anniversary to Harvey and Murtis Moland of Musgrave Harbor. 60th anniversary greetings going out to Jacob and Norma Barnes of Garnish. Happy 50th anniversary today to Bill and Joyce Ford of Belle Island. Wishing Jack and Eva Shepherd of St. George's a happy 59th anniversary. Also celebrating 59 years of marriage are Jim and Vivian Gulliver of Portugal Cove. Congratulations to John and Madeline Hamilton, who are also celebrating their 59th anniversary. Anniversary greetings going out to Richard and Ethel Park of Gillums, who are marking 55 years of marriage. Wishing Dave and Elaine Pete of Mount Pearl a happy 50th anniversary. Best wishes to Sandra and Burn 80 of St. John's, who are celebrating 60 years of marriage. They're the parents of Landon Sea Host. Jane 80. Happy 55th anniversary to Louie and Anita Armstrong in Whitless Bay. It's a golden anniversary for David and Joan Gavin of Clark's Beach. Happy 52nd anniversary to Lauren and Betty Sheaves from Porta Basque. Congratulations to Des and Jeanne Dillon of Gander who are celebrating 58 years of marriage. Best wishes to Harvey and Valma Burton of Hans Harbor on their 59th anniversary. Happy 54th anniversary to Joe and Hilda Keating of Marystown. Wishing Bruce and Shirley Hutchings of Lawrenceton a happy 56th anniversary today. Happy 51st anniversary today to Len and Julia Lynch of Wabush. Congratulations to Bill and Sheila Gugio of St. John's who are celebrating their 68th anniversary. Anniversary greetings going out to Jim and Mary Lynch of Bellevue Beach who are marking 50 years of marriage. Congratulations to Bruce and Lillian Moores of Grand Falls, Windsor on their 60th anniversary. Happy Happy 50th anniversary to Lori and Shirley Lambert of Lewisport. Wishing Boyd and Clarice Eddy of Sunnyside a happy 55th anniversary. Congratulations to Murray and Linda Loveless of Point Leamington on their 50th anniversary. Best wishes to Gilbert and Hazel Hodder of Fredericton. It's their 66th anniversary. Happy 50th anniversary today to Gordon and Beverly Howlett of Petty Harbor. Wishing Larry and Harriet Lane of Gloverton, Glovertown rather, a happy 61st anniversary. Happy 66th anniversary to Clarence and Idella Hart of Botwood. Now to some birthdays. Happy 101st birthday to World War II veteran Annie Keeping of Point Rosie Fortune Bay, now living in Toronto. Happy 90th birthday to Joseph Sharon of Point Leamington, now living in Grand Falls, Windsor. Wishing Howard March of Cornerbrook, a happy 90th birthday. Happy 92nd birthday to Melva Warren of Gambo, now living in Grand Falls, Windsor. Best wishes to Lauren Murley of Cornerbrook, who's celebrating his 90th birthday. Happy 98th birthday to Roy Fudge of Brighton, now living in Grand Falls, Windsor. Happy 91st birthday tomorrow to Adrian Power of Chapel Arm. Wishing Florence King in Paradise a very special 90th birthday. Happy birthday birthday to Marjorie Noseworthy. She's turning 98. Happy 91st birthday to Jim Wells from Cox's Cove. Birthday greetings going out to Cora Holloway from Bloomfield on her 92nd birthday. Happy birthday to Gerard Feltham. He's turning 95. Happy 91st birthday to Sarah Oliver of Northern Bay. Wishing Doris Snow a very happy 94th birthday. Happy birthday to Florence Hopkins of Greens Harbor who just turned 90. 92. 
Happy 92nd birthday today as well to Lewis Skinner from St. Jack's, now living in Portugal Cove. Happy 90th birthday to Glowina Foss of Embry, now living in Lewisport. And ending on an impressive birthday, happy 105th birthday to Gladys Dowden of Greens Pond, now living in Gander. A birthday so nice, we got to see her twice. <laughs> Sorry about that to uh, Roy and Verna Edison. Uh, we had the wrong picture up there. So guess what? We're going to try to get you on uh, next Friday. So happy anniversary to you too, and sorry about that. Okay, so this is the last weekend of August, if you can believe it. I feel like everyone should just try to get out this weekend and enjoy <laughs> as much of it as we possibly can. That's a good idea, but uh, only parts of the province are going to be able to do that as we see uh, some moisture through the weekend. Let's take a look at your Sunday forecast. Rain will continue for the west coast, northern peninsula, southeastern, uh, southwestern portions of uh, the island as well as southeastern Labrador uh, through the day on Sunday. Your temperatures are going to stay in the mid-teens, mid to upper teens, but uh, we should see just increasing cloud through parts of central, eventually eastern Newfoundland as well, where temperatures will sit somewhere between 18 to 20 degrees, so uh, not bad Sunday on tap for you. And then lots of clearing up across the rest of Labrador, especially up through Nain, 15 degrees and plenty of sunshine uh, through the day. Now, as we head into the evening hours on Sunday and eventually into Monday, that uh, moisture is going to track further east. So most of us across the island will still be seeing those showers. Southeastern Labrador as well as central Labrador will see uh, that as well through Monday and uh, pretty much continue through the day. You may see some uh, tapering to showers, though, for the west coast as we head into the evening hours. Uh, but overall, the temperatures will stay fairly similar. So we're talking about uh, mid to upper teens for the western half of the island, essentially in southeastern Labrador. Uh, back up to about 18 or 19 degrees for those of you in northern and western Labrador with lots of sunshine uh, for your Monday. But we will see those showers uh, towards eastern Newfoundland as well. So about 21 degrees in St. John's. You'll probably see a few peaks of sun, but overall will be an unsettled uh, day. Taking a look at the long range forecast as we head into Tuesday, we're looking at some sunshine. Wednesday is when we're talking about the potential impacts. Uh, if we do see impacts, will be on Wednesday uh, from Franklin. So at this point, I have rain in the forecast. Temperatures around 20 degrees. Whether we see wind remains to be seen, so definitely keep an eye on the forecast. But for central and western portions of the island, still looking at rain as well. Uh, by the time we get into Wednesday time frame, about 19 degrees through the day. And then for Labrador, we're talking about temperatures uh, warming up for Tuesday. Look at that, 24 degrees for eastern Labrador, dipping back down by Wednesday. And uh, for western Newfoundland, or western Labrador rather, you're looking at a high near 13 on Wednesday. Yesterday, last night, in fact, uh, about, oh, I guess halfway through the show, uh, thunderstorm rolled through Gander and then a double rainbow afterwards. The Kimberly uh, shared this great shot with me. She, she's never seen a full double rainbow before, oh, so is what gorgeous. a treat. Yes, thank you for that. If you have any weather photos, best place, nlphotos at cbc.ca. Oh, fantastic. Thank you so much for that. Well, that's it for us on this Friday evening. I hope you have a wonderful weekend. Good night.